Hey guys, so now we're going to talk about a topic that scares a lot of students, but it's really not that bad. Honestly, I think it's just the name that scares people. And the topic is organometallics. Alright, so now you're thinking this is going to be terrible. Organometallics sound very confusing, but they're not. They're very easy, actually. All they are is they're alkylating agents. What is an alkylating agent? It means that I'm going to be able to use this reagent to put an alkyl group on something else. Okay, so that's the first thing. And what it's going to be consist of is usually a group 1A or 2A metal, okay? So I'm talking about the first and the second column of the periodic table. Those metals are going to be directly bonded to a carbon structure, okay? Now, if you think about it, that's going to give this a very interesting molecular property because typically we usually see electronegative atoms attached to carbon, okay? Um, there have been several instances this semester where you've been exposed to an electronegative atom bonded to carbon. For example, this functional group right here, C with an X on it, remember X stands for alkyl halide, right? I mean, I'm sorry, stands for halogen, so this would be an alkyl halide. And what would be the typical dipole of an alkyl halide? Do you guys remember? Where would I draw the dipole towards? Towards the X, right? So I would get a dipole towards the X, that's gonna give me a partial negative here, a partial positive here. What kind of charge do I have on that carbon? Well, we have a positive charge, meaning that this carbon is gonna be a great electrophile. Okay, and that's typically the way that carbon acts. A lot of reagents that we've seen this semester, carbon is gonna react as an electrophile. But organometallics are different because notice that the X, right? X stands for halogen. What group is halogen in? Let's, let's start off with carbon. Maybe this is a better explanation, okay? Carbon, if I was just to draw my ghetto periodic table that I do so often, carbon is in group four. Are you guys cool with that? Halogen is all the way over here in group seven. So I'm just gonna draw seven, okay? So which one is more electronegative, carbon or halogen? Obviously the halogen, right? Because as you move to the right in the periodic table, you get more electronegative. Okay, are you guys getting this so far? Halogen, fluoride, fluorine is at the very top, so that's obviously more electronegative. But now let's think about these metal, these organo metals that we're using for organometallics. Well, I told you that these metals are usually in group one or in group two. So that means are they gonna be on the right side or the left side of carbon? They're gonna be on the left side. So actually, my metals, I'm just gonna use the letter M to stand for them in general, M, because I don't know exactly which metal it is. It could be lithium, it could be magnesium, something like that. These are going to be in group one or in group two. Okay, so which one is actually going to be more electronegative, the carbon or the or the or the metal? And the answer is the carbon will. So organometals, like I have drawn here, I just put M in general because I don't know if it's lithium or magnesium, whatever. We'll get to the exact metals in a second. The dipole goes in the opposite direction. So that means that instead of this carbon being a great electrophile, organometallics are examples of where your carbon is an amazing nucleophile. And that's gonna change everything. Oh, well, I, I wrote nucleophilic, I was trying to write nucleophile, okay? So the carbon is an amazing nucleophile because it has a negative charge now, and that means that now I'm gonna be able to use this in a unique set of reactions because normally we don't have carbon with a negative charge, but now we do, all right? So there's four types of organometallics that you guys will be responsible for. There's four types that you need to know and that are commonly talked about in organic chemistry. So the first one is sodium alkanides. These are the easiest type because most likely, if you've been doing your homework, you've already seen one of these at least, okay, in another chapter. So the way that organometallics work is we usually use a terminal alkyne terminal alkyne to react with a strong base, okay? Now that strong base, there's a lot of different strong bases we could use, but typically it's NaNH2 or NaH, okay? These bases have the ability to pull off, let's just say I'm using NH2 negative, they have the ability to pull off the most acidic hydrogen on that molecule. And when we learned in the acids and base chapter how to predict acidity, we would have found that the H at the very end of that terminal alkyne is very acidic compared to the others. So I would grab that H with my base and I would give a negative charge 
to my carbon. What does that mean? Well, that means that my final product is now going to have a negatively charged carbon, okay? And what is there a spectator ion? Yes, remember that there was also an Na positive present. We just dissociated it. The Na positive can wind up making a bond to my negatively charged carbon. Now, this bond right here that I'm drawing, and this is going to be true with all the bonds we're going to draw today, this is an ionic bond. Do you guys remember what the definition of ionic means? Okay, that's really easy. This is going back to chapter one. But an ionic bond was simply a bond that had such a great difference in electronegativity that there's essentially no sharing. Do you remember that? Basically, you, you can draw a bond, but really there's very little sharing going on of electrons. Since this bond is ionic, you can draw it two different ways. You can either draw it as a bond, like we've done here, or you could also choose to draw it as ions, with a negative there and with a positive there. Both of these representations are perfectly accurate because one of them shows that there is a bond, okay, ionic, but the other one shows how the bond is very weak, meaning that in weak in terms of that it can be easily dissociated because I have f almost full charges on both. Does that make sense, guys? And this is obviously a carbon here. That is a carbon. I just didn't draw it, but it is carbon. Okay? So the reason we call this an organometallic is because sodium is my metal. Okay? Remember that I said the group one or two metals are typically your metals? So I could actually just boil this down to being Rm. Okay? And Rm is going to be the general, um, the general structure that we're going to use for all organometallics. So R simply means I have some kind of carbon group with a negative, and M means I have some kind of group one or two metal with a positive. Does that make sense? So this one is one that hopefully you've already seen by this point in the course. This is your first organo metal. Let's go on to the next one. How if we want to make a Grignard reagent? Now, I know I might have just lost a few of you guys because that does not look like it says Grignard. It looks like it says Grignard, but it's pronounced Grignard, okay? Just got to live with that one. Just take it, take it from me. I've been doing this for a while. So you got a Grignard reagent, and how do we make one, okay? What we're going to do, you don't need to know the whole mechanism. It's fine. But what you do need to do is you need to recognize how to make it and what it looks like. Well, you start off with an alkyl halide. Start off with an alkyl halide. Then what do we do? We add elemental, meaning by itself, magnesium, elemental magnesium, and what is this? Et2O. What is that? That's an ether. Okay? Because all that means is that I have an O in the middle with two ethyl groups coming off of it. So that would be diethyl ether. Okay? So you put in elemental magnesium, your diethyl ether. That's all going to complex together. And what you're going to wind up getting is a Grignard or a Grignard reagent. Okay? Now, why is a Grignard reagent considered an organometallic? Well, because once again, we have the same situation where I have a carbon that has a carbon that has a group one or two metal attached to it. Okay, if I were to draw that dipole, it would really give almost all of its electrons to that carbon. So I'd get a partial a negative here and I'd get a positive there. Another way to write a Grignard is to draw it ionically. So I'd have a negative charge here and then I would put MGBR or I said BR because usually we use BR, but it could be any X with a positive, okay? And these are associated together as an organometallic. Is that cool? So now that's another common one, just so you guys know, X could stand for any halogen. Are you cool with that? I mean, usually we don't use fluorine. Fluorine isn't used very commonly in these, but definitely iodine, chlorine, bromine are all fair game. Usually it's bromine, but you can also use the other ones as well. Cool. So let's keep going. So organolithium, okay? So my organolithium compound is going to be super similar to my, um, to my Grignard reagent, okay? I'm just going to use slightly different reagents. I'm going to start off with an alkyl halide again. No difference there. And now I'm going to react it with two equivalents of elemental lithium instead of magnesium and ether, okay? What winds up happening is that now I just get my lithium directly attached to my carbon. That's it. There's no X on the other side. Okay? This can be written the other way, which would be ionic. Right? Okay? So once again, this counts as an organometallic 
because I have an R group with a negative charge and one of the group one or two metals with a positive charge. Okay? And then finally, we have Gilman reagents. Now, if the word Gilman or phrase Gilman doesn't really ring a bell, maybe it's because in your textbook they may not call it a Gilman reagent. They may call it a lithium dialkyl cuprate. Okay? Really, I mean, they're the same exact thing. They just have one is named after the scientist and one is just like the general name. Okay? But whatever, regardless, these are the same exact thing. If you look online, let's say you're trying to find practice problems online, and you could totally look up lithium dialkyl cuprate, and that will give you Gilman reagents, and vice versa. Cool? So you start off once again with an alkyl halide. And by a mechanism that you don't need to know, okay, please don't learn this right now. This is not what the point of this topic is. We're just trying to figure out what, how to make them and what they look like. What we're going to wind up getting is you combine two lithiums in ether. So it's the same as, really the same exact step as the organolithium. But then you have a second step. And the second step is the giveaway that it's Gilman. You have copper iodide. Okay, so you have CuI, copper iodide. And what that's going to do is it's going to take two of those organolithiums together and complex them to one copper. So you're going to wind up getting is now this structure right here. This is your lithium dialkyl cuprate or your Gilman reagent. And this still follows the general structure of RM, organometallic, because I have an R group that has negative charge. And then this copper would have a positive charge. Okay. Now I know that copper is in group one or two, but there is a lithium there as well. So that's why I count it as group one or two. All right, guys. So what do you need to know here? What, what's the point of the story? The point of the story is know your reagents to make these reaction these no know, know the the preparation step know exactly which reagents you need to make your organometallics and then know how to recognize the names of each of those organometallics okay i haven't taught you how they react yet we're going to get there but for right now just know how to name it how to make it all right cool guys so let's go ahead and move on to the next topic